Hi, I'm Laura and welcome to the Southern Institute of Technology's academic program for the Certificate in Environmental Management. Later in the show we find out how a new invention is designed to help dairy farmers and the environment and then how are the kids at Otatara Primary doing their bit for the environment. For now, let's find out about recycling in the home. Donna, recycling has brought us to this fantastic house in Richmond today. First things first, shall we take a look at the garden? Absolutely. Um, well, looking behind us, it looks like um, the wind's come up and blown their junk mail out of their mailbox. So mm -hmm. if you don't want junk mail, the first thing is um, put a no junk mail sticker on the mailbox. Um, posties and um, email or the junk mail distributors aren't actually allowed or legally allowed to actually give you junk mail if you've got a no junk mail sticker on your mailbox. All right. Oh, just looking here, they've got some weed matting down. So if you ever want to replace your weed matting, but you're not want to pay for it, a good way of um, another way of using it um, is your old sheets from your bed. Um, so you just put your sheets down as you would um, weed matting, and the weeds won't go through, but the moisture and stuff will still remain there. So mm -hmm. that's a nice wee tip. Shall we have a look at what the recycling bin is like? Absolutely. All right. Okay. So what do we have here? Oh, well, we've got a lot of glass here, obviously. Um, with the recycle crates, I mean this is your standard size recycling crates, you can actually get smaller ones and generally we give those to um, the elderly or um, disabled people who are generally living on their own and they can't um, fill up a full one and mm -hmm. it's just a little bit easier for them to lift it out and take it to the gate. Mm -hmm. um, so because there's limited capacity and obviously these guys have had a bit of a party um, and they can't put all that glass out at once, you could actually um, just drive into the drop off centre at 191 Bond Street and um, dispose of it there. Um, so we've also, I see we've also got um, some cardboard boxes in here as well, so they can just be um, flattened down and put inside a um, plastic shopping bag, tied up, put in the top of the recycling crate. Um, even the smoke packets, just take the plastic wrapping off them. Fantastic. Yeah. And they've got their wee skip here too. Yep, they've got the wheelie bin. The, the key thing with that is that you always got to remember that the lid has to be shut, otherwise it um, won't be guaranteed to be emptied by council because um, with the winds that Invercargill can get, um, the rubbish actually um, causes more trouble than it's worth by blowing out. Mm -hmm. um, so always remember to keep your lid down or your wheelie bin. Okay Donna, moving from the garden to the lounge, what can we look at for recycling in here? Um, well obviously on the um, coffee table here we've got glass bottles and a tin uh, aluminium can, um, so those can be rinsed out and put out in the recycling crate. Mm -hmm. Um, I see we've actually got some cloth bags over on the couch, that's great, I mean that's a lot better than using the plastic bags. Um, I see they've actually got a, a box of newspapers over by the fire, that's always good for lighting the fire rather than using your old lucifers and, and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but if you always have too much paper, instead of bringing it on the fire, you can actually put it out and get it recycled and it'll turn out into um, new newspaper. Mm. Or we've even got a roll of um, carpet in the corner. So that can um, be um, either given away or sold to like a second hand place or something mm -hmm. like that. They're always wanting um, new carpet. Um, now if you're ever wanting to do up your lounge, you've actually got a couple of options. I mean second hand centres are great places for um, picking up furniture, paintings, um, even curtains, drapes and, and mats and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. So you, you'd be amazed at the treasures you can find in a second hand centre. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. What about um, energy, wi um, energy wise, is there anything to do with heating or lighting in a room? Oh, lighting, that's an easy one. That's your um, energy efficient light bulbs. They're always great and they're mm -hmm. usually a little bit longer lasting than your, your standard incandescent yep. light bulbs. And I can see this flat has one just over here, yep. which is great. Which is, um, the only thing you've got to be careful with um, the energy efficient ones is if you happen to break them, they do actually contain a very small amount of mercury. Okay. So um, if you do happen to drop one and it, and it breaks, um, don't use your vacuum cleaner to clean it up because that'll just spread the mercury dust around the house. All right. um, just clean it up with a damp cloth and um, put that cloth and any other bits of rubbish out in um, your wheelie bin wrapped up in a, in a bag. That's great advice. Yeah, and also um, leave your windows open and get away any pets or any small children because they could be affected by it. Mm, so there's quite a lot of risk involved with those. Yeah, only if you drop them though, mm -hmm. um, otherwise um, they're pretty safe. Cool. Okay, so moving on to the bedroom, what can we look at for recycling in here? Well, I think there's something obvious down here. Um, he obviously needs a wee um, recycle crate, I think, because we've got a lot of um, paper and tissues and things um, hiding here in the corner. Um, so actually all of that there that looks just like a big, big pile of rubbish can all be um, put into a plastic bag and tied up and put out in a recycle crate. 
mm -hmm. or even used to start your fire. And the, and the tissues, um, while the tissues can't go in your recycling crate because they are considered to be dirty paper because they're wet, mm -hmm. um, they can actually be fed into a compost bin or a worm farm or even the bokashi kits that you can get tissues as well. Tissues can. Oh, yeah, because wow. they're essentially organic, being made from trees. Mm -hmm. um, they just break down the same as anything else. Probably looking around the next place, oh, it's good to see he's got a um, cloth bag down in, in the corner there. Yep. Excellent to use. And they're um, available at supermarkets? Yep, yep. any supermarkets. Um, I think it's Countdown to War we sell the, the green ones and then Pack and Save have got actually bigger, larger, more plastic type ones, but mm -hmm. they generally do sell them, which is great. Um, looking in the wardrobe, there's probably a lot of clothes there that um, aren't being worn or um, fashion acceptable these days. Um, so probably the best place is um, if they're still able to be worn to take them to a second-hand clothing place. Mm -hmm. um, or if they're a little bit worse for wear and they can't be repaired, then um, drop them off in a clothing bin. Um, you'll see the big blue bins around town. Um, so just pop them in there. And, and shoes as um, as well can go in too. Mm -hmm. I notice he also has um, a few shoe boxes around and other cardboard boxes. Yep. Uh, are they able to be crushed and also put into the green recycling bin? Absolutely. All you need to do is be able to um, flatten them down to the size of a plastic bag, tie them up in a plastic bag and put them on the top and put them outside with your crate. Okay, so now we're obviously in the bathroom. Yep. And what can we take a look at in here? Um, well, probably the most obvious one is um, stuff from your shower, you know, your shampoo. Um, God, what we've got there? Shower gel. Nice. <laughs> um, and these containers can actually be, if they've got a number one or a number two on the bottom of the bottle, if you see here on the triangle, yep. there's a number two there in the triangle, so that means we can actually recycle it. So when it's empty, just wash it out, mm -hmm. squash it as much as you can, and then actually put it out in your recycle crate. Now this one here, I think that one was actually a five. Um, so because we can only recycle numbers one and two, that will actually just have to go out in your wheelie bin. All right. Now the other one here, shaving cream. Every bathroom has this. Um, when this is empty, you can actually, because it's actually made out of steel, um, you can actually recycle that as well. So put the top back on if you've still got the top and chuck it out in your recycle crate. And I noticed that the walls in here need a wee bit of attention. What are your painting options? Yeah, um, probably cleaning them down with sugar soap first would be a, probably a very good idea because then the paint will stick better. Um, and then you could go and try, um, just go into your local paint sh shop and um, get some paint. Now resin are, are quite good and that any leftover paint that you've got, you can actually, um, they'll actually take that back. If it's resin branded, you won't actually have to pay for it. But if it isn't a resin branded paint, um, I think it's something like, a, is it $10 for four litres or something? So, I mean, if you haven't only got a little tin left, mm -hmm. um, it might only cost you a dollar. To get rid of. Okay and finally the kitchen and I can see they have a very large pantry over here so what can we look at inside there? Well we've got a lot of things I mean we've got um, tin cans or tin cans of, of like your sp spaghetti, um, what is just our chicken those sorts of things mm -hmm. um, they can all be recycled all you need to do is um, open up the can of course um, take all your goods out rinse it out fold it up and crush it as much as you can just put them out in your recycling crate with um, all your plastics, paper, cardboard and glass. Oh, we've got some food, well, of course, being a pantry, like fruits and bananas and um, eggs and things. So um, the banana skins, they're actually very good for your roses. So if you've got roses outside, put mm -hmm. them underneath mm -hmm. um, or feed them into your compost bin. Um, egg shells, egg shells can actually um, be quite good for your garden as well um, or feed them into your compost bin. Uh, it's a good way of getting rid of those. And the egg cartons that they actually come in, you know, the trays, you can actually go back to free range farms and actually get them to refill it. And you actually get a little bit of um, cost back because you've bought your own container for, for the eggs, which mm -hmm. is good. Oh, cool. um, I see they've actually got a swapper crate down there as well, which mm -hmm. is great. So you can actually um, get your bottles exchanged and they'll refill them and you actually get, I think it's about $5 off your crate okay. or something, which is cheap beer, really. Mm -hmm. um, oh, they've got bags of plastic bags, so those three big piles of bags can actually go to um, the recycling centre at Bond Street to be recycled, um, so they don't need to be thrown out. Um, oh, I see they've actually got a fire extinguisher, which is really good. So when that's full, um, while your fire extinguisher is a little bit like your um, aerosol cans and those sorts of things, um, you can actually get them refilled. Um, so take them to um, a couple of places around town, like um, Fire Protection Southland or War Mold or um, give the council a ring. Um, the councils have actually got this directory that's um, very handy um, listing different sorts of places for taking all sorts of things mm -hmm. um, to be recycled. Um, so that's available on all the council websites as well. I see up on the window they've got a lot of um, bottles and um, containers and things. So if there's any of those has got number one or two 
on the bottom then they can be recycled as well. Fantastic. Okay, well thank you so much for sharing uh, your recycling tips with us today and I'm sure everyone at home learned so much. Cheers. Thank you. With more and more farmers converting to dairying, the amount of stock effluent has increased dramatically. The Gator Buddy invention has been designed to help soften the effects on the environment. Let's take a look. Okay, Andy, where are we at the moment and what happens here? Oh, we're uh, on a typical rotary milking shed in Southland mm -hmm. and uh, this one uh, milks around 70 cows at any one time. Oh, um, wow. This farm milks around 700 cows, mm -hmm. um, so you can imagine it's pretty full on. Uh, an old day's work. What I'm here to explain is that uh, obviously each cow produces urine and defecates which in total can produce about 50 litres of effluent per day per cow and you mm -hmm. spread that over 700 cows that's an awful lot mm, of effluent. Definitely. So what happens to it from here? Um, well as you can see this is the milking system here the mm -hmm. cows come on here um, they're held in a holding yard before they're milked mm -hmm. um, which is where most of the action takes place um, and then the effluent has to be dispersed onto the field somehow. So the system is that a farmer has a holding area for the effluent. Mm -hmm. That is transported to the holding area and then it is pumped from that area onto the fields by way of an irrigator. So this is reasonably new? Yeah, um, this is quite a new unit. It's not been mm -hmm. in too long. Um, everything is now computerised, as you yep. know. Um, so basically the farmer stands at the spot you're standing, yep. um, applies these cups to the cow, yep. um, the rotary system moves round, when it gets to the end the cups are removed automatically and the cow is then released back out. Yep. And the new Gator Buddy system, can it only work with a new system like this one? No, no, the Gator Buddy system that we've developed um, can work with any system. Mm -hmm. um, we do encourage people to, if they have it, setting up a new system is to put one in at the time mm -hmm. um, because in the long term that can save them costs in parts and uh, labour etc but we can fit a gate ability to any system. Um, how many have been installed so far roughly? Um, we've got about seven out in the field at the moment yep. um, with more orders coming in and interest is just going absolutely mad. Yep so you've had quite a lot of positive feedback? We've had lots of positive feedback. Um, our system on this farm <coughs> itself has uh, done its job twice already. Oh, yeah. um, I'll just tell you if you know how an irrigator works, it's anchored to a post and then the irrigator is dragged along against that post. And we just spoke to the farm this morning and well, this morning the post snapped and the gator buddy kicked in and shut the whole system down, saving him, well, technically an environmental problem. Wow, so what would have happened if he didn't have the gator buddy system in place? If he had no gator buddy, then uh, the, the irrigator would have just sat in one spot and just basically emptied his entire effluent pit out into one spot into the middle of the paddock. All right, so really he saved himself from oh, yeah, quite yeah. a big fine. Yeah, I mean with thousands of gallons of uh, effluent going into one spot, you can imagine that can leach into the soil and end up in the waterways and the creeks. And how does it do that? Um, well obviously uh, soil soaks up moisture, mm -hmm. um, the effluent will sit on the surface, gradually soak into the soil, then be dispersed to the lowest next point which possibly would be a creek or a river or anything. So whereabouts is the Gator Buddy installed on this farm? And the Gator Buddy itself is out in the paddocks behind me. Mm -hmm. um, my partner Phil will explain how that works to you shortly. And then to your right here it will be the collecting point for the effluent which will be the pit where the control system sits. So Andy, stock effluent is quite a serious matter. Is that why there was a need for something like the Gator Buddy to be introduced? Oh, most definitely. I mean, over the last couple of years, um, there's been a huge increase in dairy farms throughout New Zealand. And um, with that comes a problem of effluent disposal. Um, obviously, councils such as Environment Southland, etc., have had to look at this as a problem. And um, with that, uh, they stipulate uh, amounts of effluent you can apply at any mm -hmm. one time. This varies from farm to uh, farm because of the soil types etc. But um, farmers have got to be aware that they can't just irrigate in one spot, they have to keep moving and uh, thus spreading the effluent over the paddock. So how is the problem sourced? How did the councils find out about the uh, stock effluent? Oh, I think um, you know it's common sense that with more cows in the area there's going to be more effluent um, which then promotes a problem of it getting into creeks and rivers, which so they've had to look at it full stop. Um, they, they go checking that regularly. They um, have a flight path from Invercargill Airport and then um, they'll fly over heli with a helicopter and uh, look for the telltale signs of over-irrigation or travelling irrigators stopping in one spot. 
but it's not just travelling irrigators, there are other systems that don't travel mm -hmm. that, that they look at as well. All right, well, let's go find Phil and take a look. No problem. What is the irrigator and the gator buddy up to here? The irrigator's travelling like it normally does, um, as per most irrigators um, throughout the country. Um, but this one has got the gator buddy attached to the back of it, which monitors it that it is moving. So it's actually, it's more controlling the pump than the irrigator itself. So if the pump's going, it wants to make sure it's spreading it across the ground, not stopped in one place. And how does this work? The gator buddy hooked to the back of it has a um, signal that it's sending out. So when the pump starts up, it starts looking for a signal coming back from the gator buddy. And if it doesn't get that signal, after a couple of tries, it shuts the pump down. So what is it attached to to help it move throughout the field? Uh, the irrigator works with a winch mm -hmm. and it hooks to the fence or another um, anchor point and as the irrigator spins round it winds the winch forward. Okay so when it's moving it therefore isn't just putting the effluent in just one area of the field, it's dispersing it throughout? Yes, the, to get a good application rate which is obviously helps stop pollution to the environment but also it can help for fertilizer um, to help grass growth they want to keep it moving as quick as possible across the ground uh, so with the gator buddy on the back it's monitoring the time that it takes to move every revolution of the wheel and if as long as it keeps getting a signal back within that time frame, it allows it to carry on moving. So does the dairy farmer have to set a time or something on the gator buddy to ensure when it's moving? Or? Uh, that's set up on commissioning and by who, whoever installs it through working with instruction manual on it. Um, the, they set the time speed at the start of the run of the irrigator, so that which is the slowest it's travelling and from there they actually get the um, time for it to get a revolution. So if anything changes from that, it'll shut down. And does the Gator Buddy, uh, do, they, do they set this at the Gator Buddy or is there a control centre where it works from? Uh, no, it's back at the control um, panel which hooks into the pump starter. Mm -hmm. uh, the Gator Buddy's also got a battery in it mm -hmm. to power it and that's a rechargeable battery which is changed usually one to two weeks depending on how much they use in the irrigator. So if the battery was to stop or go flat or if something else happened to the irrigator or the gator buddy, what happens? Uh, it would just shut down the pump and sound the alarm. Sound the alarm and how is that done? Uh, there's a flashing light and also a siren and some, of the op some people choose the option of texting mm -hmm. which they can hook in a modem to it and it'll text the farmer to say it's stopped. How does a dairy farmer get the effluent from anywhere else on the farm to the irrigator? Uh, it's from the sump where it gravity feeds from the cow shed into the sump. Mm -hmm. It's then pumped through underground pipes which come up at hydrants at various places mm -hmm. in each paddock and they connect the drag line hose from the irrigator on, onto it. This is quite complicated. <laughs> Yeah, there's a bit in it, but um, if they've got it set up well, uh, it works well. Okay, so throughout the, the farm they've got areas set up with, with the underground and they can hook it up just about anywhere or close to? Yeah, they've got certain paddocks that it, they've got consent to irrigate into. Okay. And then, yeah, whichever paddock they're using, they've got a hydrant in there. Can the gator buddy be attached to any kind of irrigator? Yes, the, the way we actually set it up in having a separate trolley that it drags behind 
means that it can fit onto any irrigator quickly just by welding a clevis onto the irrigator that comes with the gator buddy and if that irrigator broke down for any reason they can hook it onto a temporary one by even just tying a piece of rope onto it so it's universal onto any irrigator. Well, thank you so much Phil for joining us in the wind and rain here and well done with your fantastic product. Yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Yeah. Earlier this year, Otatara Primary received an environmental award for their native seed planting project. And today we've recruited some of the students to find out about their scheme. But first, let's hear from Elliot about the award. Elliot, can you please tell me about what Otatara Primary won at the Southland Environmental Awards this year? Well, at the Environmental Awards, we won um, this award and the trophy in the background. We won it for planting seedlings and helping out the environment by them. Yeah. We get fantastic support from our community and we've got a person who's been a parent of the school, Barry Smith, uh, who's worked the project almost from conception with the children and has supported us right through that and his children have since left the school but he's still got equally as big part to play in there so Barry helps the children and we've got a, a staff member that works alongside him. And whereabouts did you plant the native seedlings? We planted it in the um, glass house out around the swimming pool. Are all the students involved with planting the seedlings? No, not all of them, but most. It's when they grow up to be around year fives, they plant seeds and then they sell them as a year six. We were supported by North Rotary, who provided a propagating house, um, but the rest has been totally self-funding. So what we made from plant sales and has supported the program right through so we haven't had to go to exterior funders. Elliot, what do you think about the, the planting scheme? Well, I think it's quite a good opportunity for kids to just get out there and plant. Yeah. I think it gives them good ethics and values and it teaches them um, the value of, of trees and the greenness of the environment that they in fact live in and also the business skills that they've got to work out how much it's going to cost to buy the uh, soil and the, to go in the or buy the bags first, then the soil and um, advertising costs and those sorts of things, and how much they have to make to, to break even and then to make a cost factor on top of that. Okay, now up to the planting. My friends and I are going to tell you how we turn these little seeds into big trees. Here you go, Tessa. Thanks, Elliot. Well, when we get the plants here, there are little tiny seedlings and before we sell them, we have to plant them in these bags and get really good soil. Once we put the soil in it and made it all tight, we shove our finger down it and then we put the little seed into it and then we just wait till they grow. Here you go, Liam. Thanks, Tessa. After we've poked the hole in them and planted the trees, we bring them into this propagating house where they stay and they get a bit of rain but not, en um, but not enough to jack kill them. And they stay in here for about a year and then when they're big enough and there's a lot of them, we'll put, have a plant sale. And with the money we get from there, we buy things. And we sell plants like the pepper tree, flax, cabbage tree and a lot of others. And it's a good fundraiser. Yeah. Thanks, Liam. So you might be wondering, how do we get our money to buy plants? Well, we do that by, when we sell our plants, we also sell worm pea that's produced from worms in this worm farm here. There's around thousands of worms in this worm bucket. And when we get our worm pea, we put it into bottles, then sell them, and they're good for fertilizers for these plants. When we sell these plants, the money that we get we use to buy more plants and then sell again. Now on with the process. Thanks for your I'm going to be talking to you about the process of selling these plants. We set up a trailer about every four weeks and sell these plants. We make hundreds of dollars from selling them. We also sell pay and make about $40 per selling. We, most of the people that get the plants uh, live in the community because one of the, a child of their family goes to the school and we put it in the newsletter. All the leftover plants we 
we plant and around the school and around the community. I'll pass on the process now. Thanks, Monte. Well, some of the plants that don't get sold, we find spots around the school to plant them. And most of them will go around the outside of the school and in 20, 30 years time, they'll be grown into big trays. Some of the plants that we don't plant at the school, Mr. Mitchell's gonna get a group of people and we're gonna plant them on my dad's farm in wet spots. That's it for today, we hope you enjoyed the show. If you would like more information on the Certificate in Environmental Management, please call 0800 SIT to Learn. We'll see you next week.